We'd like to move right along and make as good time as we can. <coughs> Chapter 5. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in her open places if you can find a man. If there is anyone who executes judgment, meaning justice, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Notice, God's just looking for people who seek truth. If He can find one in Jerusalem, He says, I'll pardon the city. God said He'd pardon Sodom and Gomorrah if He found ten righteous. He makes it sound like He'd, he'd pardon the city for one. In the case of Jerusalem. However, since Jeremiah was clearly one who was righteous and seeking the truth, and he lived in Jerusalem, perhaps we should t- consider this to be a hyperbole. Uh, because there's a sense in which one could be found. In fact, there were more than one because Jeremiah had a, a righteous friend named Baruch. And there were a few other people who, who stood with Jeremiah. So I think rather than, um, rather than say literally that God would spare the city for one righteous person, although it sounds like he's saying that, he's essentially saying, you're going to have a hard time finding righteous people in this city. If it were otherwise, I'd spare the city. But this is just the problem. You can appreciate my problem in pardoning this city when you go around looking for a righteous person. Uh, you may find it a, a wild goose chase. But go ahead and check it out. See if you can find one who seeks the truth. Sometimes we feel the same frustration in, in this country, uh, even, in, even in the church. Uh, if you haven't found that frustration, then I don't want to... I don't want to disillusion you, but I, but I, I know that's not that I, not that it's hard to find one, but it's hard to find many uh, in the church who just who just love the truth and want to sacrifice everything else for the truth. Uh, there's a lot of people who have a casual interest in in the things of God, but it's not very easy to find people who are obsessed with the kingdom of God in the way that it seems appropriate to me. Anyway, verse two, though they say. As the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. Remember we talked about that expression. That was a, an expression that was typical of a regular means of swearing in the name of the Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with swearing in the name of the Lord or saying as the Lord lives. That is, as Jehovah lives. It's a typical means of taking an oath. The problem is, though they, they swear in the name of God, they're not really God's people. They don't really have any right to bear his name. They're taking his name in vain. In fact, the command in the, the third commandment that says you shall not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain has a first application to this very issue of taking oaths and using the name, taking his name as a means of affirming your words when in fact you're, it's an empty, it's empty verbiage with you because you are not really living uh, in a way that, that qualifies you to use his name. Uh, and so that's essentially what it's saying here. They're swearing falsely. They're bearing... Uh, they're taking the name of the Lord in vain in their oaths. They, they have not, in other words, given up altogether the idea of worshiping Jehovah. They still talk like they believe in Him. They still use His name in their oaths, in their religious ceremonies and so forth. But He says it's all a show. These people are worshiping idols, but they haven't you know, thrown out Jehovah altogether, at least not ostensibly. Though He accuses them of having done so. He accuses them of having forsaken Him, the fountain of living waters, and gone out and hewn for themselves cisterns and broken cisterns that can hold no water. Yet, outwardly they haven't forsaken him. Outwardly they still use his name. They still have a pretense of being serving God, but the problem is in their hearts it isn't so. Verse 3, O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock, they have refused to return. Now, when he says, uh, are your eyes not on the truth, I'm not sure exactly how he means that. Maybe he means that God, it seems like you should be doing more to promote the truth. Uh, don't you look favorably upon the truth? Uh, here, you have stricken these people, but truth isn't prevailing. They're not repenting. They're not grieved. Uh, they're uncorrected. Anyway, he says, therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish. For they do not know the way of the Lord. That's true poverty indeed. Not knowing God. Mm -hmm. A man is a rich man if he has the knowledge of God because the knowledge of God is greater in riches than uh, gold and and silver, the Bible says. They don't know the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. Now he seems to contradict himself here. 
In verse 4 he says, they don't know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But then he says, I'll speak to the great men because they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of God. This either means that there are some older people, which is what he means by the great men, older men who can remember, who do know what the average person in Jerusalem didn't know, that is the ways of God. Uh, many had forgotten even what the law said. Remember, the book of the law was not yet rediscovered here. And most people didn't even know what the law of Moses was. But there might have been some older men who did remember those things. They have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of God. Or else, alternately, he could be saying, there's a sense in which these people can be said not to know the way of the Lord and not to know the judgment of God. There's another sense in which they can be said to know it because they have experienced the judgment of God. That is, God is now judging them. And now they find out what the way of the Lord really is like and what the way of the Lord is. Now, you know, in one sense they don't know it. In another sense they are experiencing it in the, in the form of God's judgment upon them. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Remember Psalm chapter 2. Yes, John? When it says that they have known it, that maybe it's in the past, but they've chosen to leave it, and therefore they don't know it any longer. That's possible, too. Perhaps he's saying they used to know the way of the Lord, but they don't anymore. That's a third way of understanding it, yes. Um, in Psalm chapter 2, it talks about the, the heathens raging and the people imagining a vain thing and seeking to revolt against Jehovah and against his anointed one, his anointed, the Messiah. And they say, let us cast his bonds from us. Let us break his bands off of us and cast his cords from us. Uh, in other words, they don't want to serve him. They don't want to be servants chained up and in bondage to God anymore. And that's what these people have done apparently in verse 5. They've altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, which means accept the yoke of servitude under me. My yoke is, where, is what I usually put my cattle in to pull my plow. Jesus says, I have a yoke too, and I want your head in the yoke. I want you to be serving me. I want you to be under my control. The yoke is the means by which a, a man would steer the cattle as they served him. He would direct them. He would control them. To take a yoke upon you voluntarily would be to accept slavery and servitude and allow someone else to govern your life. That's what Jesus said we should do. These people, however, have done the opposite. They've broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Uh, therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. Again, this is Nebuchadnezzar. A wolf of the deserts shall destroy them. A leopard will catch, I'm sorry, will watch over their cities. These are just three different ways of speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, the enemy who is going to come against them. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many, their backslidings have increased. How shall I pardon you for this? He asked this question several times. It's sort of a refrain in some parts of uh, Jeremiah. How shall I pardon you for this? As if God's always looking for an excuse to pardon, but he just can't think of any good reason to do so. He can't, he can't in any way justify himself in pardoning them. It's as if he's casting about for some good argument that would entitle him to pardon them without compromising his justice, but he can't think of any good argument. Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves like troops in the harlot's houses. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Now, whereas in most of the references to adultery prior to this, it has been speaking about idolatry as a spiritual adultery. This case, I think, is talking about actual adultery on the part of citizens because it's not speaking of the nation as a woman going after other gods, other men, but rather it's talking about their ch the children of Israel. Your children have forsaken me. So it's talking about their individual sins of adultery. And rather than casting Israel in the role of, a, of an adulterous wife, he talks about the men of Israel, how that they have gone after other men's wives. So in addition to the spiritual adultery, he accuses them of actual adultery as well. And that in spite of the fact that God had treated them well. He fed them to the full. He blessed them. He protected them. He prospered them. And the gratitude they show for his benefit is to rebel against his laws and to go out and commit adultery. They just, you know, when people are prosperous, they begin to think of prosperity as their, as their right. Uh, and a lot of times, if you're self-indulgent or if your lusts are satisfied in one area of life, where you might think, well, that, that should placate my lusts because, I, you know, I've, they've been satisfied in this respect. 
The opposite effect is true. When you make provision for the flesh, the flesh just exerts itself any way it can. You know, you give the flesh a little bit of uh, control, you satisfy your flesh in one area, and it just decides that it, it has the right to have all of its desires satisfied. When you get, when you're self-indulgent and you're eating and you're fed to the full, that's not the time when you can say, well, my flesh should be satisfied now. I probably won't have any problem with lust. The opposite is true. When you're most, you know, when, when you've indulged your flesh the most in one area is when the flesh is bound to say, okay, now that appetite's satisfied. Let's go after this other one. You know, and the flesh is just affirmed in areas. And that's why fasting, although it is not prescribed in the Bible as a means of disciplining the flesh, yet often it has the effect of quieting the lusts temporarily. Uh, now, you may not find this to be true, but I, uh, I can say that I have, and I think I've heard others testify the same, that when I'm not feeding my body food, its other desires often are, are less uh, demanding as well. Uh, just because, I mean, and this is not the purpose of fasting. I want to make this clear. The Bible speaks against using fasting as a means toward sanctification. That's asceticism. Paul says that it doesn't do, do any good to have this touch not, taste not, handle not approach to, to spirituality in Colossians chapter 2. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a side effect that is, is noticeable. That when you begin to deprive your flesh for whatever reasons of one thing, your flesh begins to lose its grip in other areas too, I think. And we find this to be true. They sat down in, in, uh, at the Golden Calf Incident. It says they, they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. After they indulged their stomachs, then they went out to indulge their hormones. And so also here, when I fed them to the full, then they went out and ate after each other's wives like well-fed horses. They said, well, now what's next? I enjoyed the meal, now let's go enjoy a little um, philandering. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? This also is a repeated refrain. Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I believe you'll find the same statement found in chapter 9. In verse 9, yes. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? One of the many recurring refrains in Jeremiah we encounter here for the first time. Verse 10, go up on our walls and destroy. Apparently he's calling for the Babylonians to come and do that. But do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. The King James Version says, take away her battlements. I don't know if you have other translations in front of you. But uh, uh, does anyone have a translation that uses something other than branches there? Take away her branches? Okay, the modern translators seem to agree about this. The King James Version I don't know how they came up with battlements. It probably has to do with the vowel points on the Hebrew wording, but apparently modern translators are, are, are in consensus on this, that the, the correct statement is take away her branches. Very important uh, decision to make about the translation. If it is in fact correct here, and it seems to be, then it agrees with another statement later on in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 11:16. If you look at Jeremiah 11:16, it says, The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire upon it, and its branches are broken. Notice in chapter 11, verse 16, he speaks of Israel as an olive tree, and he says, Because of the judgment of God, the branches have been broken off. Also here in our present passage, chapter 5, verse 10, Take away her branches. For they are not the Lord's. You know, of course, there's a New Testament echo of this language. In Romans 11, the Apostle Paul compares Israel with an olive tree. He gets that from Jeremiah uh, 11. Uh, Romans 11:17. Paul speaks of Israel as an olive tree that has the natural branches have been broken off, he says. And other branches representing the Gentiles have been grafted on their place. The idea of breaking off the branches of the olive tree representing the judgment coming on unbelieving Israelites comes from Jeremiah. We encounter it here in Jeremiah 5.10 and also in Jeremiah 11.16. And Paul picks up the idea in Romans 11 and speaks of Israel the same way. 
Only, of course, what he's talking about is an ultimate wrath. An ultimate judgment has come upon them because of their rejection of the Messiah. The branches that were not believing were broken off. And they were replaced by Gentile branches that did believe. That's how Paul argues his case in Romans 11. He gets his language from this passage. Okay, Jeremiah 5.11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets become wind, for the word of the Lord is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. Now, what he's saying is, these people have made this statement that these prophets that are predicting famine and the sword, like Jeremiah was, that that's not really the Lord speaking through them. The word of the, the, word of the Lord is not in them. And when it says, they say, thus shall it be done to them, this is what the people are saying about the prophets like Jeremiah. Oh, these prophets are saying we're going to have famine and the sword. Well, it's not going to happen to us, but it'll happen to them. We'll smite them with the sword. We'll put them in prison and deprive them of food. They'll, they'll experience famine and the sword, but we won't. That's what they're saying. But verse 12 says they're lying about this. They're denying that these words from Jeremiah are coming from the Lord. And sure enough, they did treat Jeremiah this way. Verse 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people wood, and I shall, it shall devour them. Now, it's not clear exactly whose words in whose mouth is fire. It could be Jeremiah. God could be speaking uh, to Jeremiah, saying, your words are going to be like fire, and it will consume these people like stubble or like wood. That would agree with the imagery of Revelation chapter 11, where we see the two witnesses who prophesy for 1260 days, and it says fire goes forth out of their mouths to consume their enemies. Well, are we to understand this literally, that there's people who open their mouths, it's like flamethrowers come out of their mouths and, and wipe out their enemies? Or is it more this same imagery, that a prophet who speaks the words of God, especially if they're words of condemnation and words of judgment, it's as if fire, the judgment of God, is symbolically referred to as fire. It's as though judgment from God is pouring out of their mouths against these people and consuming these people. Uh, it's also possible that God in verse 14 is speaking to the false prophets or to the people, but I think it's more likely that it's talking about Jeremiah's words. It would be like fire. We know that later on he spoke of the word of the Lord in his belly was like fire. And so this is probably a, a reference to him. Remember chapter 23 and verse 29, which we looked so long for yesterday. Okay. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation, this is Babylon. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end, he repeatedly says. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. This is the way Isaiah I heard them described too. He said, Surely these people have closed their eyes, they've shut their ears, they may see and not perceive and hear and not understand. So they're described. They have physical eyes, but they don't have spiritual eyes to see what's going on spiritually. They have physical ears, but they don't have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And Jesus is implying the same thing when he says, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. In many cases, when Jesus made remarks, he made that kind of statement. The idea being that everybody has ears on their head. But he's talking about different kind of ears. Spiritual ears. If you can hear spiritually, then do. These people have physical ears, but they don't hear spiritually. They have eyes to see, but they can't really see spiritual things. The natural things, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? 
who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it, and though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they, yet they cannot pass over it. Since we just finished saying Job, no doubt there's many things in Jeremiah that re will remind you of Job, including this statement. Uh, God reminds Job that, that he, or I think it's actually Elihu who reminds Job that God uh, set boundaries for the waves of the sea and they can't pass over those boundaries. The psalmist says the same thing. It's a typical thing for the prophets or psalmists to say. But it's kind of interesting how many points there are paralleling in both Job and Jeremiah. Uh, both of these men were groaners and uh, a lot, there's a lot of things that are, that are uh, like each other in them. Verse 23, But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season, who reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good things from you. Earlier we read in verse, uh, or chapter 3 and verse 3, that therefore the showers have been withheld, and there's been no latter rain. A judgment has come upon them, which Jeremiah is interpreting. They, they have had no rain. There's a drought. And Jeremiah says, that's because you've rebelled against God. Now he says the same thing. Your iniquities have turned these things away, meaning the rain and the weeks of harvest mentioned in verse 24. He says in verse 25, it's your sins have withheld good things from you. Verse, yes. I think so. I think so. Because Deuteronomy predicted the literal cessation of rain as a judgment, as one of the many judgments, he said, would come upon them if they, uh, if they rejected the word of the Lord. And... Uh, you know, while, of course, we could, we could spiritualize the latter rain, I think it's more like that he's talking about the actual, the actual uh, famine and actual drought that they were experiencing. Verse 26. For among my people are, not, are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and grown rich in dishonest gain, that is, through deceit and so forth. They have grown fat, they are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Apparently he's talking especially about the judges who should be defending the cause of the innocent and the helpless. Yet they prosper in the right of the needy, they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? That refrain we found in chapter 5, verse 9, also in chapter 9, verse 9. Here it is again. Um, that refrain, Shall I not punish them for these things? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Verse 30, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. It's a bad enough thing when the leaders are corrupt, but when the people enjoy having corrupt leaders, it's worse yet. If the people revolt against corrupt leaders, at least there's hope that things may get better, but if the people prefer that kind of leadership, prefer to be oppressed by people who rule by their own power, uh, then what, what hope is there? Of course, there have been periodically in church history times where this was true in the church. Even, even now, in some churches... Um, church politics and church power struggles uh, dominate the clergy and mm. people rule by carnal power mm. and, uh, and often people just they, they like that they like I mean not so much that they like power trips a lot of people like to just not, not make decisions for themselves and let someone else rule and it kind of re relieves them of responsibility for their own moral choices and uh, people love to have it that way sometimes. Even if the prophets are prophesying falsely. You know, in a, in, in a church I was once in, which was into the shepherding movement, one of the elders told me, you know, if, if an elder tells you to do something that, you're not, that you don't think you should do, do it anyway and the responsibility will fall on him, not on you. Well, wouldn't that be nice? If I was relieved of all obligation to make moral judgments about anything, I just do what I'm told, unquestioning, and I'm not responsible for anything I do wrong. Because the guy who told me to do it is responsible. 
No, the Bible doesn't say that's true. But some people love that kind of an arrangement. I mean, let the prophets prophesy falsely. What do I care? As long as I'm not responsible, I'll, I'll have it that way. Uh, I don't care if they're right or wrong, just so I'm not responsible for the mistakes they make. And uh, so there is some of this, even in our own day. But what will they do in the end, he says at the end of, verse, of chapter 5. Now in chapter 6, O you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem was half on the territory of Benjamin and half on the territory of Judah. And you remember when the nation split into two nations, Benjamin remained loyal to Judah, so the Benjamites were still a, a, a regular uh, you know, port, a portion of the population of that nation. And Jerusalem had uh, a lot of Benjamites in it because it was half positioned on Benjamite territory. So he says to the children of Benjamin, Gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a signal fire in Beth Hakarim. For disaster appears out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Well, we can see that in many passages he's done that. He's, he's used the imagery of a woman. A lovely woman whom a lot of men want to seduce. Uh, he's likened Israel to that because uh, she has been seduced and even is actively seducing uh, other religions, other, other gods, other men, as it were, in the imagery he uses. The shepherds with their flocks shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture in his own place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. Now, apparently these are the words of the invaders speaking. They're called shepherds with their flocks, meaning invaders with their armies, are encamping around the city just like shepherds and their flocks do in times of peace. Well, now those shepherds and their flocks who are usually around the city have been replaced by commanding generals and their armies besieging the city. And their words are recorded in verses 4 and 5. Uh, they say, let's go up against her. And they even bemoan the fact that the end of the day is drawn here because they want more time to attack. Uh, they don't want to rest. They don't want a night to go to sleep. They want to just keep fighting. He's just speaking of their militant and aggressive and hostile attitude, how that they want to incessantly destroy and attack. And even when the, they say, even when the evening comes, they just figure, well, we'll just keep fighting at night. Verse 5 says, Arise, let us go by night uh, and destroy her palaces. Verse 6, For thus has the Lord of hosts said, Hew down trees and build a mound against Jerusalem. These are talking about siege works that were built by uh, besieging armies. They would cut down the surrounding trees and build ladders and platforms and so forth to try to get over the walls and build up mounds so they could get up over the walls. So God's sort of speaking to the Babylonians here. Hew down trees and build a mound against Jerusalem. This is a city to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. As a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. Violence and plundering are heard in her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall strongly glean, I'm sorry, th thoroughly glean, as a vine, the remnant of Israel, as a great gatherer, Put your hand back into the branches. Uh, thoroughly gleaning means they'll leave nothing behind. Usually when a harvest takes place, the harvesters go through and grab the big clusters of grapes and stuff, but a few, a few you know, lesser clusters that weren't worthy of their attention will be left behind. And the gleanings, as they were called, that is what's left after the harvest, after the general harvest, was usually left for the poor. And in fact, the law forbade the Jews to go back and glean their own vineyards and their own fields. They were supposed to leave the gleanings for the poor. It was okay to go through and do a, you know, a thorough harvest, but whatever was left behind after the first uh, pass through was to be left. However, these people who are harvesting the vineyard, Israel is here compared with the vineyard as elsewhere, in Isaiah particularly, and the vine, these great gatherers, these Nebuchadnezzar, will leave nothing behind. They won't just harvest, they'll glean uh, everything. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised. They cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Some people's hearts are uncircumcised. 
we were told earlier. Now we hear their ear is uncircumcised. Their ear is incapable, not of hearing, but of hearkening. Uh, they cannot give heed. They can hear his words, but they are incapable of responding. Their heart is too committed to evil. The word of God is just something that annoys them. It's a reproach to them. They have no denied in it. They just soon be ignorant of, of these warnings. Therefore, I'm full of fury of the Lord. I'm weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside, on the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, and the aged with him who is full of days. In other words, everybody will be subject to this judgment and be wiped out. And their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Now he says this judgment is going to come on everybody. But nobody is necessarily going to be sinning, uh, uh, suffering for someone else's sins. Everybody deserves it. From the least of them to the greatest of them. They're all given over to covetousness. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, The love of money, another term for covetousness, is the root of all kinds of evil, which some, seeking after, have pierced their, themselves through with many sorrows. And so, covetousness is something that is the root of all evil. It's interesting that the last of the Ten Commandments is, You shall not covet. And there's a sense in which it covers all the others. Because every one of the other nine ten crimes has been broken at one time or another out of covetousness. Covetousness is the motive that underlies much sin of every kind. People have murdered for the love of money, taken a contract on someone or murdering someone to possess their vineyard or whatever. Like Nabal's vineyard was taken that way out of covetousness. He was murdered by Jezebel. Uh, people have committed adultery for money, for love of money. I mean harlotry, prostitution. Yeah, you can count on it. Women who are prostitutes not doing it because they love sex. They do it for the money. People who pander pornography and produce it are not doing it because they love pornography. They're doing it because they know someone else loves it and will buy it. They do it for the love of money. If there's no love of money, there'd be no pornography industry. Uh, every kind of evil has at one time or another, and, and even to this day, been uh, committed for the love of money. Theft. Thou shalt not steal has been violated for that. Bearing a false witness in court. Uh, a judge taking a bribe out of the love of money. Perverts judgment in court. There's a lot of... Uh, I mean, covetousness is not a little thing. And the interesting thing is, though Jesus said, beware of covetousness, let me tell you something. There's only two sins that Jesus said to beware of. If you look at all the times Jesus said beware, he'll say things like, beware of uh, men for they shall turn you over to the synagogues over. but that's not the same thing as beware of a sin that's beware of sinners but of particular vices that Christians are told to beware of there's two Jesus said he said beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees which is hypocrisy and then that, that's in Luke chapter 12 and later in the same chapter he says beware of covetousness two vices Jesus specifically says beware of now why do you say beware but to warn someone of a hidden danger you don't have to tell people to beware if you think that they, are, they already see the danger. Uh, it's, it's of something where you see a danger and you're afraid they don't. And so you give them warning. Beware. Watch out. And Jesus never said beware of drunkenness or beware of adultery or beware of murder. Why? Because everybody can see the danger of those things. I mean, it's not likely that any Christian is going to be living in adultery or, in, or as a murderer or a thief and still think he's doing something that's make, that he's still a good Christian. I mean, Christians may do those things, but they don't mistake those for Christian behavior. But covetousness and hypocrisy are very common vices among Christian people who don't even know that they're doing something really wrong. They don't recognize them for the vice that they are. And hypocrisy... And covetousness are very rampant in religious circles. They were in biblical times, they are in modern times. And yet Jesus spoke against covetousness probably as much as any other sin. And he told us to beware of it because it's sneaky. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, love of money, covetousness, these are the things that, like thorns, grow up to choke out the seed. 
very subtly. And uh, so here, everybody's given over to covetousness, and that's one reason why they're all going to be wiped out, he says, in verse 13. Everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. They've lost all conscience. They're not, they don't even know how to be embarrassed of their sins anymore. They're reprobate. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time when I punish them and be cast down, says the Lord. By the way, this uh, statement here, they've healed the hurt of my people slightly, is a repeated refrain also. And the words that follow it. Over in Jeremiah 8, you'll find it. Actually, from 8.10 on, you'll find the exact wording that we just read in chapter 6 on for a number of verses. In the middle of Jeremiah 8.10, it says, Because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the hurt of my daughter, the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. In the time of their punishment they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Notice that's identical to the passage we just read. Some of these repeated refrains in, in Jeremiah are several verses long. Some of them are just a single line. But when it says, they have healed the hurt of, my, of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, that's an interesting statement. It's like the people are hurting spiritually. They're sick spiritually they need a position but all that the false prophets do is try to take the pain away saying peace peace you know don't be afraid everything's going to be okay but that's not true instead of healing people by telling them the truth hey you need to repent they just try to tell them well everything's going to be okay everything's going to be rosy and and they take the pain or the sensitivity to their sinfulness away the awareness that they stand to be judged is what, is what could possibly lead them to repentance. And it's better to keep them in pain so that they'll keep seeking the real cure rather than to heal them slightly. That is just to remove the pain, the symptoms. Uh, my grandfather was kind of an eccentric fellow. He was, a, he was a Christian man, but he was very different. There's some things he never did. He, for instance, he never thought toothbrushes were good for people's teeth, so he never got one. And... Uh, he would never wear sunglasses because he thought sunglasses were probably bad for the eyes. These innovations that came up during his lifetime, he just some of them he just suspected they weren't very good for him. He also would never take aspirin. Uh, not because he was, you know, a, a word of faith person who felt like, you know, you just got to confess your healing, it's wrong to take medicine. That, that was far from it. His rationale was, well, if you've got a headache, it's because something's wrong. If you take an aspirin, it won't make that thing right. It'll just take the pain away so you won't know that something's wrong. And uh, so he resisted uh, anesthesia and so forth and painkillers because he thought, well, that's just... I, I don't know when he was under surgery, whether he did. But, uh, but he felt like you're just living in a fool's paradise if you just try to make the pain go away when really that pain he felt was God's way of telling you something's wrong that needs attention. Maybe you've got too much stress in your life. Maybe there's you know, high blood pressure. Maybe there's something else. Um, maybe you, use, you drink too much coffee or something. I mean, but, but a headache is symptomatic that something else is wrong. And he felt that just to take aspirin to make the pain go away heals the hurt slightly. It makes you think that everything's okay when it isn't. It's like saying, peace, peace, but there really isn't any peace. There's something really wrong inside and you're just trying to mask it with, with relief. And, uh, well, I don't know that I'd agree with him that it's wrong to take aspirin or anything like that. It wasn't a moral issue with him. He just thought it wasn't wise. But it's, it's a rather an illustration of this in the spiritual sense. If people's conscience is hurting them, we shouldn't try to counsel them saying, well, you know, you're not really that, that bad, you know. Don't feel so guilty. You know, it's very probable that if their conscience is bothering them, then they are guilty of something, and it'd be better to heal them, go to the core of the problem, and say, well, listen, the reason you've got problems here is because you've rebelled against God and you need to repent. But, you know, some people just pity the counselee so much that they just try to make them feel better when really there's some radical surgery that's needed and they heal them slightly and tell them everything's okay but it isn't it's 
better to go ahead and, and, uh, and tell them what they maybe don't want to hear. Surgery can be painful, but at least it's permanent. And it's not deceptive. And so these false prophets, and saying, listen, God's, God's pleased with you. You see, actually what the false prophets were saying, we find out later in chapter 7, was that there's no danger of judgment coming on Jerusalem because the temple of the Lord is here. And to them, the temple of the Lord was sort of like a good luck charm. A little bit like the, the Ark of the Covenant had been in the days of Eli, when Phineas and Hophni took the Ark of the Covenant out against the Philistines, and they thought, wow, this will save us now. And they they kind of looked at the Ark of the Covenant as a, as a good luck charm. Well, in Jeremiah's day, people looked at the temple that way. They said, hey, you know, when Assyria came and wiped out all of Judea, they even came against Jerusalem. But don't you remember the angel of the Lord went out and slew 185,000 Syrians and defended Jerusalem. They began to feel like they were invulnerable. That God was miraculously always going to save Jerusalem because his temple is there. And they began to trust in the temple as uh, a defense. And the false prophets were saying, because the temple is here, there is no danger. And so they were, they were contradicting Jeremiah and, and other prophets like him who were saying, God's going to wipe out the temple. He's going to wipe out you guys. He's going to take you all into captivity. You're going to be slain by the edge of the sword. And they're saying, nah. Don't you know? The temple of the Lord is here. See, if you look just for a moment over at chapter 7, we can see that he has to address that. In chapter 7, verse 4, God says, Do not trust in these lying words which say, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger and the fatherless and the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place or after other gods, go after, walk after other gods you hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place. You know, it's just the fact that the temples here isn't going to cause you to be able to dwell here securely. You have to amend your ways to dwell here securely. The temple won't save you if you're shedding innocent blood and walking after other gods and oppressing the stranger and the fatherless. So you can see that the mentality, the false words, the false prophets were giving was that, don't worry, nothing can hurt us while the temple's here. Because this is God's temple. He'll defend the city. Don't listen to these prophets who say judgment is coming. It's, it's all a false threat. And Jeremiah says, no, these are the false prophets who are offering security and complacency and saying, peace, peace. When they're not in touch with reality, there really is no peace. There's judgment coming. And they're healing the hurt of my people slightly. Better for them to feel their headache so that they wonder, what's wrong with me? Maybe I need to change my lifestyle. Maybe I need to drink less coffee. Maybe I need to do something to reduce my blood pressure because I'm getting headaches. You know, maybe I have a brain tumor, you know, that needs radical surgery. An aspirin can just mask a deeper problem. And Jeremiah said, you need to address the deeper problem not have a slight healing that just kind of takes the symptoms away, uh, the pain away. If these people are told that judgment is coming and, and the fear of God is in them, maybe they'll repent. Maybe they'll actually get cured. However, this slight healing, this, this, this pain removal, this pain suppression that the false prophets are giving by saying, it's, everything's okay, is hurting the people more than it's helping them, he says. It's made them so they don't blush at their sins. They don't feel any shame. Their conscience is numbed. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. Jesus used the same expression, you will find rest for your souls in Matthew 11.29 when he said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 